three. Thank you so much uh, for coming on again. Sorry about that, Bonnie. Uh, we oh, had that's okay. uh, good conversation, and I was so sad, so sad. Uh, <laughs> okay, so can you introduce to yourself um, again to the uh, audience, please? Sure. So my name is Bonnie. Um, most people know me across social as Posh Notions or Posh. Um, so I currently own a custom t-shirt design business uh, where I design and then hand make t-shirts. Um, we talked a little bit before about the fact that I have a few different chronic pain illnesses, one being rheumatoid arthritis, uh, my fibromyalgia, and some other things. Um, and the business sort of stemmed from the fact that I couldn't work a conventional job anymore. Um, so my biggest plan right now is to become a speaker and help, that my, <laughs> help other people who have uh, chronic pain illnesses or other cr chronic illnesses in general um, get unstuck leave that feeling of hopelessness and helplessness behind because that's how I felt when I first got sick um, so that's probably quicker than last time <laughs> yeah yeah thank you so much for that yeah, um, uh, I, I love what you do and um, like I said before that you inspire not only me, um, you, I hope that, you know, because you talk about um, you're and a mom who are doing an entrepreneurial adventure and building your own business. And I hope that this matches go to a parent, a mom, and they don't have to, you know, like for you, it's incredible because you have a mindset that, because uh, we live in the world of culture where we, push our message that we should get like a traditional quote-unquote job right right and so and we get pushed so much and it, it kind of kills the average person and that you're an inspiration to your kids you know um not only that they uh i think you say your younger daughter look up to you um while your son is an introverted and the other one um it's you know she's in the um just uh, like you know her state i can't remember what you say like she don't believe it yet but she so i have four kids i right. have 19 um almost 17 one who will be six on monday and then a two and a half year old so it's boy girl boy boy um and you're right so my daughter is the eye roller she's my second oldest um and I just, she thinks a lot of, and, and we talked, we'll probably get into this at some point, but she thinks that a lot of what I talk about now is kind of like fluffy or hippie or she doesn't get it. Um, and she's kind of in that, almost in that teenage angst phase right now, you know, where uh, she hasn't quite found what makes her happy. and she's got 16 so like you know that's totally normal um but i made a huge transition a couple of years ago about a year and a half ago year, yeah about that um and so it was a big change for her and for my older son because i made within a few days this this massive like because of getting off medication, which we talked about, this massive, massive like mindset shift, and and that was the beginning of it. Like it wasn't said and done in a couple of days. It took a really long time to, you know, another year and a half to get where I am now. Um, but it was kind of like, like I not a stranger, but almost kind of like a stranger to her because she was used to me being irritable and getting upset easily and um you know the past the five six years previous to that i was pretty miserable like i tried to fight it but i was pretty miserable uh and that when you're a mom like that just it you know seeps into everything 
you know? And so for her, yeah, she's still kind of, I, I don't know if she's in disbelief or it's just part of her personality. She's a lot like her dad. Um, she's, a lot, she's a lot like both of us. Um, but she gets some of that cynicism from him. Um, and whereas my older son, we talked about, he's on the spectrum. Um, he's more introverted. Um, but he's also unfortunately been circumstantially taught that people out in the real world are kind of, can be kind of nasty. And yeah. he bullied a lot, like severe bullying a lot, all the way through school. Um, but so the entrepreneurial path makes good sense for him. Um, and I think it will at some point for her too, because she's an artist and that's what she really wants to do. Um, so for my young, the one you were talking about though, is my five, he's going to be six is, um, my son thinks it's really cool because like, I'm talking to YouTubers, I'm watching YouTubers, you know, and YouTubers is a very broad word, but in a five-year-old mind, he's watching these people on YouTube, they're YouTubers. Like he doesn't quite understand, you know, the, the, there are people who are marketers and there are people who are gamers and there's people who, like Evan Carmichael, who's an entrepreneur turned YouTuber, you know, he, YouTube is his medium, his main medium of getting his message out. So he thinks it's really cool because mommy's talking to YouTubers and mommy's going to be on YouTube and, and he's got this whole idea that YouTube's just this really cool thing to do. And so he gets a big kick out of that. Uh, he's not as much interested in the t-shirts and stuff that I do. Like he, sometimes he is, he likes to work with me and do some things. Um, but I think the fact that I've been meeting people online and then going to meet some of them in person just really does it for him. Like that's just, and my two year old, yeah, he's kind of, he's not clueless obviously, but he doesn't really understand much of what's going on right now as far as, you know, YouTube and t-shirts and business. So. Yeah. Thank you so much for um, uh, saying, it's not just that, I think it's the cultural norm. I think that the culture is that, you know, you're supposed to get a job and, you know, security and not being an entrepreneur. I think that people joke upon uh, being an entrepreneur because it's not, in a way, it's not cool for people. I mean, it's cool now because, you know, the uh, Evan Carmichael and Gary V, they make it cool. Um, right. Uh, but as for your son, also, yeah, I can understand because when I was little, I was shy and introverted. And we talked about this a little bit. And I didn't know how to talk to people. And uh, I was bullied because, you know, I'm like, I'm a nice guy and I don't want to, you know, fight anybody, though. So, there's certain time when I was a teenager, I um, get into fights, but I think it was unnecessary. But because uh, you know, we introverted like our own long time. Like um, I forgot what you said. Can you uh, uh, gap between what you said? I can't remember the other time when you said about introvert or how we can bridge. I can't remember. About what? Introverted. Like you know how like you said we should like go out uh, or. Oh, well, no, what I was talking about and was my understanding of introvert versus extrovert was different, actually, before you and I talked the other day. Right, right, right. And you kind of clarified that as that introverts tend to get their energy from their alone time and extroverts get their energy from being around other people. And I had never heard it put that way before, or maybe I didn't ignore it, I don't know. But that, to me, wasn't, when you think of introvert like a stereotype of introvert people think pe people who just don't want to be around people who like to be by themselves but when you put it in terms of energy that makes a lot of sense um because yeah. and i was talking to a friend of mine actually yesterday about this and um so like people who have anxiety really bad anxiety i've had struggled with anxiety my entire life um being in crowds of people tends to be overwhelming. And what we were talking about was, for me, it's, it can be both. So like going to say, I don't know, a, a conference somewhere um, that has 
I'm trying to think of, of a good way to put this. So going into a room full of people that I feel like I have nothing in common with and I'm not really sure, like if I would go to like a, a vehicle expo or something, you know what I mean? Like I would feel really just kind of out of, out of place. Yeah. You know what I mean? And that would suck some of my energy because I don't, I can't talk cars with these people. Like I my, I know some about cars. I know some about, you know, car audio because my husband does that. But it's not really my scene. And I would find myself completely probably drained by the time I was done doing something like that. But then I go into something like, like I was telling you, I drove to Jersey last year with uh, my two older kids to go meet Gary V. And there was a lot of people in this place, but it was energizing to me because like I could turn and talk to some, most people, most of those people and have something to talk about. Like it may have been, might have been something different with every single one of them, but I would have something somewhat in common, at least have a, you know, a short conversation with. And like when I went to um, see Evan, like there was probably, I don't know, maybe 35 people, 40, maybe more people in there. I don't, I don't even know because I was there to see him and that was energizing for me because it, one, Evan brings some massive energy, let me just tell you. But two, like I could turn and talk to like, and he made us do this and and like I found out the one woman lives right underneath my mother-in-law like I would have never turned around in a room and just started talking to somebody you know at a car convention like I would be like uh, I don't you know what I mean so I now that you put it that way in terms of energy it makes a lot of sense to me um and I'm still trying to figure out like am I an introvert or extrovert I'm not really worried about the label but it's it was made me think a lot about it the past couple of days after our conversation well um, i think it's people think that introverts don't like to go out at all and i don't think that's true i don't think now that you've explained it to me like i don't think that's true i think if i took my son who doesn't like crowds of people at all he's historically never liked crowd any crowds of people and took him somewhere that you know they were doing electronics demonstrations or computer demos or something like that he may be more it may bring out a different like side of him like you know what i mean like he may not even the crowd of people might not even bother him i don't know so i i don't know i think it you helped me under re um redefine that stereotype which is amazing because i i love not having stereotypes you know yeah, yeah, I mean, of course, we live in the world where it's just a lot of stereotype. Uh, but no, um, the reason why we also bring this gap between, because you, you we, we, I want to get more into this, too, because as you say, you love, because um, I can see that you're enthused about uh, Evan, right, Carmichael? Uh -huh. and, <laughs> so he's all, you, and you mentioned this, too. He's an introverted. And I yeah, think that's that, right. Yeah, and, and that blew people, my mind. Yeah. And so many people have this bad image. That's why I want to get rid of this stigma that introvert. I'm telling you, there's so many spectrum that people, because over the years I have studied a lot of people who you don't even know that are extroverted. Like one of my look up to are Bob Proctor. There's an entrepreneur guy. His name is Guy Kiyosaki. There's, um, there's so many successful people who are extroverted, but now they're gregarious because they work on it. Now, uh, you mean in introverted? Huh? They're introverted? You mean they're, they're introverted? Yeah. They're, oh, okay. they're really intro Like, the most successful people are like, holy cow. Um, I don't know if you know the, because um, uh, Gary V is more like extroverted. Um, but you can tell by the way that he said hustle. The, but the thing is, uh, we're, we talked about this on a little bit too. Um, and um, relationship are based upon energy exchange, right. and um, you you know this. You, you can explain after I explain. It, is that you can feel a person energy. You you explain this too. Um, uh, that you can feel a person energy when they're warm. Or can you um, say that? Uh, explain that to the audience. Oh yeah. So I was just we were talking about energy exchange, and I was just saying that for me especially since I've gotten off of the medication I was on um, 
a lot of my sensitivity to things has come back in a good way, sometimes in a bad way. But that you can feel like it's almost like a temperature change. Oh yeah, um, that's good. That's good. Cool. Energy, like, huh? So you're around somebody who's like warm and and happy, and they have a good aura about them. Like a lot of people, you know, can read auras. There's different ways to talk about this, but like. They, they come in and instantly, like even hearing that they're going to come visit you makes you, like I have goosebumps because I'm thinking about my friend Lauren right now. And I get so excited when she's coming, no matter what kind of mood I've been in or if I'm having a tough time, like I get really excited because when we're together, we somehow raise both, like we could both be in a crappy mood, but for some reason that the, the general energy about the both of us by the, by the time five minutes is up, like both of our energy, our moods, like everything bad that's happened, we're not even thinking about it anymore, but you can feel that almost like a temperature where it's warm. And when you've got a person who is constantly negative, and I don't mean somebody who's putting on a front, because this is one of those things where it's, so you could have, so, so like my daughter, my daughter's, she's a good person. I would never, I don't mean bad to say about her, obviously, but she kind of puts on this front almost of like this negative brooding kind of, you know, that's why I was saying like the, the teenage angst kind of thing. But if she was truly a negative, like nasty person, she, I would feel cold every time she walked past me or walked into the room or, or was in my you know, general was, and I don't feel that, which is how I know that although she may be struggling somewhat as a teenager, deep down, that's not who she really is. And it would be the same if you had somebody who was, who was really negative and kind of evil and, and was faking being positive, they're not going to walk in and exude this, this warmth. Like you're going to, I can sense that. Like I have a very keen sense for fake people. Um, for, uh, I guess a lot of people like to call it the, the, what the bullshit ometer, like you can tell from a mile away that, that it's all BS. Like whatever's on the surface is all BS because they're really not a nice person. Um, but yeah, there's, there's some kind of, it's almost like seeing a, a like a little kid smile or hearing them laugh and you instant, like that's contagious. If you can't help but to laugh or smile yourself. Like that's a perfect example of somebody exuding good energy like i could be miserable and my two and a half year old does something goofy and start he has this contain i keep trying to record it because this contagious giggle that like you can't help unless you're like a cold-hearted person like you cannot help but start to laugh with him even if you have no idea what he's laughing about like and and that goes for a lot of little kids you know what i mean um uh, I, I know what you're coming from because um, I have a nephew and he do the same thing you said laugh. I think it's um because I because a kid is uh, a baby when it's being born it's pure of energy. It's not right. being, it's not being molded yet. That's the thing right. that uh, irks me the most. It's like we live in this culture that it's molding um, ideas that it's not it's not correct it's it's it used to work in the industrial age and we're living in this fast-paced technology that it, these ideas are controlling our perception and our lens and it controls how we affect the world it's actually an effect on our body our effect on this world and when you say temperature that really like clicked that that one i learned today from you like <laughs> holy shit you're right um people yeah you can tell even though they like for me if a person who pretend to be nice you can tell they're putting up the front right right you can feel their energy you you don't have to they don't have to explain it to you they like your energy is just an information that you feel off a person because um one time i because uh i was being aware of energy based on uh, in 2013 that i never knew so there was this person in my neighborhood he was walking one day and i was walking near him and i can feel the dark cold energy and i was like what is this i can feel it and i was like, oh i don't want to be around that that's but for me when i try to raise my vibration or you know not just affects my but like try to like when you're positive 
and when you have this warm energy, people can feel it. And I, um, every time I go out, even though I'm introverted, uh, I wasn't always like this. Um, uh, I try to talk to people and make people smile. But to, for me, I did it as a test and offer, uh, observation because I want to see how people react to my energy. And I okay. use that energy in, to see what happened. And people, usually when people are happy, they generally make you feel better. But when you're like down and out, you, you can feel that they're really depressed. They don't, you kind of not want to be near them. It's not like that, but it's like, for me, when I don't want to be bothered, it's like, yeah. But you're right. It's like temperature change. And when it comes to, um, I want to talk a little more about Evan and how you, you, because you talk about, I saw your post on uh, Instagram. You read the uh, one word. Can you also explain about your one word and what makes you want to read and into uh, Evan? Uh, sure. So um, we talk, I'm going to go back just a little bit. Um, <laughs> I know it's a lot. I know. Let me give some context because, um, so, and we can dive deeper into this as you ask questions. But basically, back in 2017, a lot of things changed for me. Um, and a lot of it was mindset, a lot of it was quitting a bunch of meds I had been taking for years and years and years, and for depression, anxiety. Um, I had surgery. Couple months later, I broke my ribs. I was trying to run this T-shirt business that I was still kind of fairly new at, um, and I wanted to just like give up on my business. Like I was burned out, and I was. I had just met my friend Lauren, who's now like my like we're soul sisters. Like that's, I've known her for. I met her in like August of 2017, so not even a full two years yet and we just connected but something she had suggested to me was doing eft tapping oh yeah and right. yeah mm -hmm. and i actually i had to go back and think about this last time because i couldn't remember how i landed on evan in the first place yeah that's okay i was i was i do remember being in the kitchen and um after the eft i got a suggested video and it was either tony robbins or gary v i think it was tony but and I just kept letting it like autoplay, basically. Huh. So I ended up Tony and then Gary and then Evan. And um, and I listened to Evan somewhat at that point, but Gary really caught my attention. Like, I think because of the way he delivered and the way, like, he, the way he delivers his message, um, like, no BS whatsoever, no filter whatsoever. Oh, like, yeah, definitely. Out, and I love that because that really, that's, me like you know like not i'm not him obviously but like that's <laughs> okay. typically like i don't sugarcoat stuff i don't like bull crap i don't like beating around the bush i'm just gonna tell you and if you don't like it then don't ask me my opinion like i don't <laughs> you know what i mean so um i listened to evan somewhat here and there and then i didn't for a long time and then i jumped on one of his live youtubes at one point a couple of them and something with Evan at that point didn't vibe with me. I can't remember exactly what it was, but I wasn't as attached to him at that point as I was to Gary Vee. Um, so fast forward, and I was still engaging with Evan's content, just not as, um, not as much. And I happened across uh, one of his posts popped up, and... It said something about see you soon Pittsburgh and I was like whoa wait a minute I'm like I, so I jumped on and I was like you're in Pittsburgh right now like wait what is going on here and uh I was like I have to go and then I was I was thinking I'm like well I can't go because I was taking I was doing those Humira injections for my rheumatoid arthritis I was talking about and they knocked me down for a few days like feeling like the flu and I usually take them on Friday evenings Evan was coming Saturday and um, and actually he direct messaged me, which blew my mind because I asked in his post, like on his story post, like, are you in, P like, what's going on? Are you in Pittsburgh? Da, 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 da. Are there still tickets? And he DM videoed me back. And at that point I'm like, I, right before that, I'm like, I can't go. I'm not going to go. Um, and I get this DM video and I'm like, huh? Like, so he took the time. He's on tour. Took the time to like message me back. So I decided to bump my Humera to the 
night after the, so Saturday night, like when I got back. And hurried up and made these t-shirts and they were tour t-shirts and, and I went. And it was crazy because it was snowing, it was icy, it was miserable. The muffler on my husband's car was like falling off. So it was loud and obnoxious and smelly. And, um, and I show up at this event and I walked in first and I wasn't going to, like I was gonna wait cause that's back to that introvert extrovert thing. Like, I'm like, I was, I got really nervous all of a sudden cause there's nobody in the room but Evan and his wife and Danny, his uh, videographer. and. I'm like, what the hell? I'm already here. Like, what, what horrible stuff is going to happen? Like, I'm just going to go in. I'm going to give him these shirts while nobody's in the room. It'll be less awkward. Here, he was on a live. So I ended up giving him these t-shirts on his Instagram live. And it was, like, the most amazing experience because I was nervous he was going to be offended or upset that I used his, like, logo thing from his website. It's not his logo, but it's it was a logo ish thing from his um it's called the circle of uh crap is that why is that it's on the circle of um um is that's why you have it on your twitter the profile twitter uh the is it on there? yeah no because you have the uh profile the 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 headler you have um like the circle of something believe or something I might, yeah, yeah, that's what that was. So I just, I took the, the, I can't remember if it's the circle or what. <laughs> <laughs> I, I got it, I got it for you. I, hold on, hold on. Um, uh, keep talking. I, and I actually, I have the shirt right here. Oh, hold you on. got it? You got it? I do. All right. Forgot that I have this oh, hanging here. Okay, so what's it called? There circle you. potential. Ah, okay. So can you see that? Yeah. Okay. Holy shit. So I made him one. That was beautiful. Made, thank you. So I oh. made, here's the back. Holy shit. Oh, okay. I like the back. I like it. <laughs> right. Uh-huh. That's beautiful. Thank you. Yeah. So I customized uh, one for him and one for his wife, Nina, and then mine was different. So you see this right here. It says, um, let me see if I can get that up there. It says experiences. Can you see that? Oh, yeah. I see software and I see experience. Yeah. Okay. And it says, I am here. This big thing right here. Right. I keep forgetting that the camera's over here, not in the middle. <laughs> so, anyways, on theirs, I put, you are here. And kind of like the, you know, the little map marker. And then on that mine, I put, I am here to signify, like, this is my experience. You know, I get to come here and be a part of this. So, he was, like, elated. And it wasn't what the reaction that I was expecting because it, to me, in my mind, he's like semi-famous and like lots of people. I mean, he's got 2 million subscribers on YouTube. You know, I didn't realize how much of a big deal to him it was going to be. And he was like showing people and reading it and he put it on and wore it for the Pittsburgh event. And I was like, you know, starstruck, right? And, and I never expected any of that. I figured at the very, you know, he would have said thank you and, I don't know, stuck in his bag or so. I have no idea. I, no, I don't know idea what my expectations were because it happened so fast from the time I actually decided to go to getting there. Um, so, anyway, I, I went, sat through his event and it was, it was amazing. And the next day, um, so I was lying in bed because I thought, did my shot and I'm, exhausted and I can't do I decided to, to buy his book your one word and it was two day Amazon Prime which is awesome because I had it in my hands before I could even stop thinking about it and I read it in like two days and it so my one word is spirit um, and after going through his book and taking lots of notes and looking things up in the dictionary and thesaurus and Everything, so I had this list of words and they didn't seem connected, right? So like tenacious and um, I'm gonna draw a blank now, but like, um, <laughs> regardless, I had this ten list of 10 words to describe myself. And once I started putting kind of like drawing the lines and connecting the dots, they all pointed to the word spirit, which 
for me embodies like everything I'm about. So like not quitting, not giving up, um, being persistent, you know, high energy, um, willing to, you know, wanting to give to others and help others be happy. Like there's just all these different ways you can use the word spirit to describe things. And every single word I had picked fell like fit right underneath that. So that ended up being, that's, that's my one word. And basically the, the, the concept of the book um, is that it's, Evan believes that there is one word to describe who you are as a person and what your purpose in life is. And it's so, and from, from that, you basically, if, it, if a decision comes up and you have, you know, you're looking at your options and whatnot, if they don't fit under that word, like if they don't fit, so if, if something pops up and, and my choices, you know, I have five different choices or whatever, and it has to fit under that word spirit. Otherwise, like I don't do it. Does that make sense? So like, so if you came to me um, with a project you wanted to do and, or, or whoever came to me, so I don't do anything political. I don't do anything that would be considered like racist, racist or hateful or anything like that. Um, I don't, so I have like my morals. And if you, so if you came to me with a project and it, it was something that was blatantly offensive to somebody else, I would tell you no right off the bat. Like I'm not, you're gonna have to take that project somewhere else. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna do that for you. Um, because I believe in the spirit of people. I believe in the spirit of giving. I, you know what I mean? Like there's all these different things that um, spirit means to me. And that would be like an easier one. But like if you came, I, I, I guess I'm not doing a great job of describing this, but like, if something came up in your life and you had to make a yes or no decision about it, it should be an easy yes or no based on what your one word is. So. Well, to your, talk, uh, to your point also, I mean, it's, I guess people, um, he's a really cool guy. Uh, the, for me, the way I see it is that people, my message is for people, uh, it's always my message that people think that just because people have a lot of subscribers and you know um, followers or their celebrity status, they're not God. Most people think they're God, but they're um, they're not God. They're just like you. It's just that they develop their talent. They have um, uh, a lot of attention, of course, but they're just like every human uh, people. They they have feelings, they have flaws, they're not perfect. People think they're perfect, they're not. Um, but as you said, you know, uh, Evan, he was you know, excited when you gave them to him. And I'm, that's perfect example. You know, he cares. For, no, he really does. Yeah, and that's what make him uh, matter to people and matter to you. And also you talk about Gary Vee, the reason why you talk about this uh, um, in when we did the uh, interview. Um, the other time, even though it was, oh God, it was so good. Um, the the reason why he vibed with you because he messaged with you for entrepreneurship, at, you know, at the at your age, and you look really young. You know what I'm talking about? We we talked about this before. We talked about. Um, you mean Gary V? Yeah, Gary. Go, go, no, no, not Gary V. But I'm talking. Oh, about, Evan. No, no. We're okay. So, and we're talking about Gary V, where you're talking about how at your age it wouldn't be uh, like you thought it would be like you know like most people thought it would be over like, oh yeah you said to me i was talking about with uh gary v and you said you were drawn to me because i'm one of the people who are over 40 who doesn't feel that it's over yet like i'm right. just starting and that's that's the thing that people that's make me uh that's what it's so attractive like your mindset it's like you don't see it as an ending you see it as a beginning like, the, I don't see that in every 40-year-old or um, adults that have uh, a enthused about life. Because if I go out right now, tons of people are, 
I don't want to like look down, but it's made me sad because you know my neighbor, um, you know, he talked like how uh, I, I disagree with his point, but he he used fear in, uh, as a trap instead of using this uh, his experience to move forward. You know, that's why a lot I, of people. Look, I mean, I've, I'm guilty of that myself. I mean, I'm going to be honest with you. So we talked a little bit about school and why I quit and whatnot, and we can talk about it again if you want. But um, so I ended up going back for something completely different. Um, but my kids were already three and one at that when I went back to school. And I went because I had been in a car accident and I wasn't allowed to work and I don't like to sit still. And I'm like, I got to do, do something with my life. You know, I've got these kids to support. And, um, so I went back to school for accounting because I'm like, okay, well, this will be easy and it pays well. And so I did my two years of school and I worked in the field for, so 2005, so about six years off and on. Um, and then I got sick in 2011. And to be honest with you, had I not gotten sick, I'd probably still be at an accounting job. Like there's so much that changed that day. Um, and, and beyond that, now I can't say for sure because I also had two more kids. So who knows? I may have decided to stay home with them. I may have, you know, taken some time off and gone back to my job. Like I have no idea. Um, but it did pay well. Like it wasn't, I wasn't a millionaire, but it paid well for somebody like me at that time, you know. And so it, for me, it was getting sick that was like this catalyst almost. Um, but it wasn't immediate. Like I, I lost my job. I was miserable. I couldn't stay awake most of the day. I was in a lot of pain. Um, and then, Several months later, I found out I was pregnant with my now almost six-year-old. And that was a big game changer for me for obvious reasons. But beyond that, like, I couldn't lay around anymore. Like, my other two when I got sick were 11 and 9. So they were pretty self-sufficient. Like, they could get themselves up for school, get dressed, you know, cook, cook if they needed to. Like, those kinds of things. They were able to manage. <clears throat> but getting pregnant again was like okay, like we're not only are we starting over after a decade plus, but I can't sit around and, like throughout this pregnancy. Like I just, I can't. And then he came and of course, you know, mommy ain't easy and, and there was late nights and this and that and the other. And um, he forced me to get active. Whereas had I not had two more, I could very well, you may not have ever heard, we may have never even met because I could have just kept sinking into depression, stayed on depression meds, stayed on my couch and been content. I mean, I don't know if that's what would have happened because um, I've never really been a, like a sit still kind of person. But part of that was I started looking for ways to make money and because um, we were like perpetually broke. I had a mortgage and I had this and I had that. It's like a two person income household, you know, and I wasn't making any income. So I started looking for ways to make money. And I think we talked about, like, I, I've always had somewhat of an entrepreneurial sense, just, you know, always trying to make money from, you know, as a kid. And that was, that's what we were talking about. We were joking about how, um, so Gary Vee always talks about picking flowers and selling them. Oh, yeah, 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 you did, yeah, you yeah, did, yeah, yeah, you did talk about it, yeah. Yeah, and I was doing things like making French, like custom friendship bracelets and making other things and selling door to, a stationary door to door. And I can't even, I started babysitting when I was like eight for my parents and then 11 for the neighborhood kids and um I uh, was always doing something like I started selling Avon, Avon at 14 under my mom's name just because I wanted to make mo more money than babysitting and I thought you were Lexi I'm doing redoing the interview for the other day all right all right I love you be careful see you in a couple hours with my husband this is Mr. Johnny what up? hello <laughs> he said hello is that your what no, those are the ones that got messed up 
for Joby. If you want them, you can have them, but they're messed up. Are those? Yeah. Well, they get messed up. Look at the A and the, the E and the A got smushed together. I have to put, I have to, I'll put transfer tape on for you. All right. I love you. Bye. Um, he doesn't usually get home to like three, but anyways, and you can also hear the language. Like my language is pretty off color sometimes, like swear word, <laughs> but I'm trying to keep it kind of clean and PC here for you. So, um, we're not PC. That's the wrong word. Clean. I'm sorry. <laughs> But anyways, I'm usually pretty PC. But anyways, um, so yeah, I always had like an entrepreneurial gene. And I think a lot of that stuff, like Gary talks a lot about, I mean, a lot of people talk a lot about adversity and how that really can push, if you use it properly, it pushes you into like go mode, like if you let it. Um, I wanted to be a doctor when I was like five. Like I was completely aware of the fact that we were probably one of the poorest families on our street. You know what I mean? And, you know, my dad worked for university so that we could have scholarships when we grew up. And so anyways, it, I get to this point where I've released from my job and the, my wheels start turning again. Like, what can I do? You know, I'm disabled. I can't, I wasn't even allowed to drive at first for several months um, because my body just, I had no reflexes for a long time. And, but then we've got a baby on the way. And I'm like, babies cost money. Like, babies need lots of stuff. And I am historically the one that would jump into, it would be panic at first and then it would be go mode. Like, I would go panic about whatever it was and it, I would instantly start problem solving and trying to figure out like what do we need to do to make this work and i was talking about like ebay and listia and i was i was actually we were talked about this too like there's so there's reezy resells now and i'm friend with super unsexy who's on twitter and instagram and they do a lot of this what gary calls retail arbitrage i was literally doing that like six years ago and i'm kicking myself now for not sticking with it but I really ended up hating it. Like I overcomplicated it and started to hate it. Mm. But that was one of the first things I did was the eBay thing and um, doing resale. And I had learned way back when that you could buy stuff at a thrift store, you could find new stuff at a thrift store, you could find designer stuff at a thrift store, and you could flip it. So the, the entry for like the cost entry was fairly low. And I was doing really well for a while. Um, and it just, like I said, I ended up hating like the whole process besides the shopping part. <laughs> like that was still kind of fun. But, um, so uh, to, to get back to like the entrepreneurial thing, it, it, at one point it was after I had my son, my, my six year old, I got pregnant with my now two and a half year old and I was still trying to find ways to make money. So I think we were talking before about how this didn't start out as a, like a passion driven business. Like it, I'm not going to lie. It wasn't like I needed to make money. And I knew that my husband's team, um, they use a lot of decals, like window decals, um, on their vehicles and had come across a way to do that. And my first, because my first thing to him was, do you think if I make these, that the guys on the team would buy them? And he said, yeah. I said, okay, I can justify the cost of, you know, getting a machine and startup materials. And that's how it really started. I don't really do decals much anymore because I don't like working with that kind of vinyl. But that's what my husband was just talking about was um, there's a couple sitting on the table for one of his teammates. Um, but it, in the beginning, it was, it was, it was a drive to fill a need and that need at that point was income. Like I needed, I needed to be creative because I think that's why the eBay thing for me didn't work because for me, there was no creativity really involved except for maybe the copywriting, you know what I mean? And it, so that wasn't filling that void. This kind of did both in the beginning, but 
it, it still for a long time wasn't a passion driven business. I think that's why I kept burning out so many times is because I was only doing it at that point. Like it got to a point where I was only doing it for the money. Like I like designing like a lot. Um, and I love seeing people's reactions when they get their finished product. But there was a lot of stress behind it because I needed to be making a profit. Like I needed to be making money at all times in order to keep justifying to myself to keep going. So, yeah, that's, it, it has since morphed into something completely different, which is a really good thing. Well, thank you for being an example of that. Like, we need more of that in this world. Like, uh, I think that to top off with the education and uh, work place, right? Um, uh, my mission to is to back to special education because I was special education, and I thought it was stupid. But obviously, I think that um, the workplace or the school place is built so you can work for the rich, not for to be an employee. I mean, to not become an entrepreneur, but to be an employee for someone else to build someone else's dream instead of their own. Because I see so many people, um, they don't have a vision for themselves. It's so sad, but I'm glad that. Um, that you have a vision for yourself and that would impact not only me and my viewers but for the world because I think that it's it's meaning that it's possible you know you you make it like um, that you can do your dream and it can energize you and you spoke see the thing is people don't understand when you spoke about your passion when you spoke about the 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 love of you're doing your passion, it make you light up. It make you sp like jump out of bed, and you want to make you want to do it. But that's the problem with the workplace and stuff like that. They don't want to make you. Most people don't want to jump out of bed. No. No, and I think there's been a huge shift just even in the past ten years. Like you were saying, how Gary Vee and Evan like they've made entrepreneurship cool, whereas back in the day, you know, back when I was a kid, like you had to be i mean you had to have capital to build a business right it was a completely different model you, and most businesses failed most businesses still fail like if you're still going after two years you have a pretty good chance of continuing but they say most businesses fail within the first two years and back then if you were an entrepreneur you know a businessman you put your heart your soul your savings into building this business and if it failed like that was a really big deal. Like now people can jump from business to business to business if they want to. And you know, the cost of entry for a lot of those businesses is really low. Um, now I grew up in that, like I said, my dad was working at a university so that we could all have university scholarships. Um, and I blew mine. Like I tried multiple times and I hated it there. Like I, everything I tried, I hated. And, you know, my sister went and she's not going to talk about her, but like she, she went for a little while and, and dropped out. And, but you're right, because when I was a kid, I wanted to grow up. I wanted, I wanted to be a doctor because doctors made lots of money. That was what I thought when I, you know what I mean? And I wanted to help people. Um, like as I got older, it became more about helping people and what I was going to do after I got my doctorate and my, you know, my PhD. And, you know, I wanted to open a free clinic because access to healthcare where we lived was so, it, it was, um, it just wasn't available. And, but I did, it was like, you're going to go to school, you're going to get married, you're going to have kids, you're going to have a house. Like that was, that was the dream. That's like what we were, because we didn't know any better. Right, right, right. That's about, true. Never in my mind was I thinking about, am I going to be happy? Like that never, I, I'm telling you what, I don't even think that crossed my mind until maybe two years ago that the whole point of all of this is not to have the house or to have the, it's because people think those things make you happy. And although nobody was saying that out loud, nobody would say that out loud. It was like just the thing to do. And, and until people started blowing the whistle, like, like Gary does and some other of them about like the things don't make you happy. And a lot of us are going, what do you mean they don't make you happy? Like, this is what we grew up learning. You know what I mean? Like, 
And like, crap, you're right. Cause guess what? I have a house and I have a family and I had, you know, and I had the great job and I was miserable. You know what I mean? Like, I love my family. Don't get me wrong. But when I was first facing all of that with the, you know, having the mortgage and doing all this and things were going kind of peachy for a while and then they weren't, it was like the house didn't make me happy. The house was just, it was an accomplishment. Um, and just another material possession. Like it's happy is about your mindset. And I mean, we can talk about that more, but like, that's, I was still thinking that five years ago. That but, that, like I was still striving after that was like, if we just had enough money, if we could just do, and it's, you know, it's, it's not, it's not going to like money's a tool to bring I, I, for me anyhow now money is more of a tool to have experiences that bring you joy happy is an overall being happy is an overall mindset um things don't make you happy like they they, they just don't Thank you so much for that. It's like you put it beautifully. Like that's why I was like, I was like, yes, finally, I can like hear someone say. Because I think that the the culture norm, you know, the people for me, this is my message. It's always message. Um, try I try to deliver my best. Because um, I'm using my platform to way uh, to raise an awareness against people. See the things we live in. Because you know, back then I didn't even know that there's info like because you look when you say it it clicked we wasn't aware because we didn't know any better and i wasn't aware that there was this world that existed like holy shit like yeah like we didn't know like what the fuck is you know like you say like e um eft or law of attraction or entrepreneur you didn't even know and so we didn't know any better but also uh people still because i'm a millennial and people look down on millennials because people think that we're entitled i don't know but i don't think so i think they're, they're just throwing around because i don't know but well real quick to touch on that i think uh, to be honest there are a lot of millennial kids that uh, do have a sense of entitlement um but i think what happens and it's like and i can only say this because i've literally had kids and basically with a generation gap like there's 13 years between my oldest and my second and my third oldest and then there's 16 years between my oldest and my youngest so they were uh, are being brought up in two completely different huh. decades right like more, almost two decades you know what i mean and People, like a lot of the people that are, so I went to school with, like they grew up a certain way and we all vowed that our kids would never grow up this way. They were never going to be poor. They were never going to be without. They were never going to, this whole list of things, because we had it in our minds because of what our parents taught us that like being poor was a bad thing and not having stuff was a bad thing and not having a house, right. was a bad thing, not having a car. Right. So we're fed all of this, right? So then we turn around, we vow like we're never going to be like our parents and we're going to make sure that our kids have everything they want, blah, 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 blah. Now, I wasn't one of them, luckily. I was, my whole thing with raising my, especially my two older ones, was it's my job to give them what they need and then some of what they want. Like not everything they want. Like that just doesn't. But a lot of people went the, the opposite extreme from their parents, which their parents didn't give them any, really any material possessions. Do they want to give their kids everything? And everything in their mind is material possessions. So now you do have this entire generation of millennial kids running around thinking that because their parents gave them everything, so should the rest of the world. But then you've got the other group, that, like you, that, that, that don't think that way. And unfortunately with the, the internet, I mean, negativity goes viral like it just does and once somebody latches onto the idea that this is how these this group of people is it's it's like stereotypes it's just like any other stereotype it spreads like wildfire and 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 i can even see a little bit a little bit of it in, in my two older kids here and there and i have to get them put them back in a place like you're not entitled like to live here after you're done you know you turn 18 you're living here because i want you to have a safe place to live and da, 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 da. but like i am not and, and i never did provide them with you know thousand dollar presents and 
because I knew what would happen. I mean, me growing up, my dad looked at those people as spoiled. Like that was just what we call people who got everything they wanted. Was and I refused to have spoiled kids. Like my kids were going to learn work ethic, but I didn't mean to, to cut you off. But that's I think that's where that's my opinion anywhere of how that ended up happening. Just because I lived like the flip side of that, like, and and yeah, it's okay. It's okay. You it, uh, I, it's it's an interview. I'm doing an interview. Just letting you know. That's my son. My older son. <laughs> it's okay. It's um. It's okay. Uh, uh, but you were saying about about millennials. People have this idea that you guys are lazy and whatnot. And well, I mean, it's I not, People think we're lazy, but I think it for me. Um, when I was little. Because we, I come from a par uh, family of uh, really uh, poor, uh, we have to live on you know welfare and stuff like that, and have to go shopping for my family. You know, that's where I think that's the uh, message. I'm gonna, people think that we're entitled, but you, people don't know where people come from. For me, um, every day since I'm my older uh, brother, I have to go shopping for my family, and I didn't like going shopping because it was so hairy. Uh, we don't have a car, and we have to like fucking like carry a bunch of grocery and it was so heavy and I don't want to do it. And so, and what ended up happening is since, you know, as the older brother, I had so much pressure uh, chip on my shoulder. I didn't want it to do it anymore. So I don't want it to do that. So, but also I think that because, you know, my neighbor think that having material possession is a measure of success. Having, that mean, you're, you're doing yeah. well, but that doesn't mean you're doing well. It means people have this perception that it makes you happy. But the problem is, this is people- Give me so, one second. Where do you want screws? There's a giant bucket of them out in the garage. Are you looking for wood screws? Oh crap. Drywall okay. screws? I'm so sorry. Okay. Okay, it's okay. Uh, the, the, the problem is we, the, when we measure success, in, it, it shouldn't be measured in material things it should be measured how happy you are we are and how satisfied how fulfilled we are instead of that that's why i see you're fulfilled a little bit or more when it comes to uh providing your service for product for people and when you talk about your you know crowding interest and also i would bring that to services that um it you say it changes you your mindset because i think that uh, my friends, uh, he been, you know, when people tell uh, who people who are depressed, they should take drugs. Um, can you talk about that? Oh, so so we were talking about um, the last time about my history with depression and anxiety and medication, and um, I would never be one to tell people not to take medication um that's only my that's my personal view what i would tell them unless they're at a crisis point is to try alternative therapies you know first or with your medication um because i i lived that medication merry-go-round cycle i i don't even know what to call it now but i started taking um depression medication when i was 16 or 17 I was in high school um, and at that time I didn't even know that now my daughter's coming in I didn't know that that's what it was um, I was having stomach issues and my mom we, I went through a bunch of tests and stuff he just left he wants someone to talk about I'm, on, I'm doing an interview okay can you text them um so I, I had a bunch of tests on all my stomach and whatnot and they the doctor and my mom gave me this pill to take every day telling me that it was for my stomach basically was the premise and at that time I didn't even have any idea what I was dealing with that it was anxiety and I went for a few years taking this medication um and it wasn't until after I had my oldest i had him and then i had my daughter actually it wasn't until after i had her um 
and started having some postpartum depression. And I went back to my family doctor and he said, okay, we're going to give you this other medication. Um, and because the internet, like we talked about, the internet was like in its infancy at that. Oh, yeah, you did talk about, yeah. You know, like in 96, when I graduated high school, I was learning how to do web design, but it was HTML code writing. And most people didn't have internet in their homes, let alone their pockets. Like, so I blindly took the advice of my doctor. I trusted him, you know, it, I didn't have a pocket pharmacist, you know, at that point. So fast forward many, many years. I mean, that was, she was born in 2002, but 2002, um, and I was on this roller coaster of medication. So I was taking antidepressants and anti-anxiety medication and medication to sleep and medication to stay awake. And it was like, it didn't, I didn't ever really question my doctor much because I'd come in and I'd say, okay, this is what's going on. And he'd either tell me to stop taking one thing and start taking something else or whatever the case may be. So fast forward to 2017 and I'm having these like outbursts, like raging about the dumbest shit. Like there's dish, like I still hate having dishes in my sink, but I'm not stomping around the house screaming about it anymore. My son is standing here. He can vouch for that. I used to do that. And to me that at one point that was completely rational. Like I was completely justified in being that angry about dishes and I'm blaming people for my anger and you did this and made me angry. And it wasn't until like something happened and I went to my doctor, like, cause it got worse and worse and worse. And I went to my doctor and I'm like, I am just really angry. Like I rate and raging about stuff and there's another part to that that i can tell you later another time but like i said to him you know it's what can i do and i was literally expecting him to write me another script for something else and go home and try it and then you know keep going on about well that day he told me that the one medication i had been taking for 15 plus years can cause like rage and you know be anger and i mean it can cause those feelings to be more intense anyways. And I was pissed. And like, it was in a matter of 30 seconds, I lost all like respect for this man in that for 15 years, I had been coming in and talking to him about my mood fluctuations. I mean, I mean, my diagnosis list was like pages long. Like it's, it was ridiculous. And now I realize that I probably didn't have any of those things that weren't drug induced. Like, yes, I struggled with depression. Yes, I struggled with anxiety. You know, I struggled with nightmares and things, you know, post-traumatic stress and, and, and different stuff. But like a lot of that up and down was, was drug induced. And I'm like, you could have stopped this. And, and again, I take responsibility on myself because now we do have, you know, pocket pharmacies we can look this stuff up but I trusted that he knew what he was talking about and that he knew what he was doing and that day literally changed everything for me for my my kid you know and within a couple of days it, it, the medication was well butrin okay this is a really old drug that lots of people take for lots of different reasons it is a, I think it's still a class C uh drug it's safe during you know mostly safe during pregnancy like i took this pregnant with my other two kids um and i just i never walked i never went back to see him i quit i was like i'm done and after i stopped taking that medication i'm like hmm, what's gonna happen if i stop taking this one and this one and i don't even remember how many i was taking at that point to be honest with you it, it was several uh but i just started eliminating them because three days after stopping the world future and I felt like a completely different person. Like I was calmer and like stuff wasn't, I almost felt like I was sedated, like in a way, because I'm like, nothing around here has changed. Like everything's still the same, but I felt different. And like I said, I went on this like mini crusade for myself of just n not wanting to take any more, um, you know, anti-anxiety or antidepressant medications and i still get anxiety i've still felt depressed at times and i use air quotes because i feel like as someone who struggled with depression 
like I know depression can be short periods. It can be environmentally induced. It can be um, chemically induced. It can be, there's lots of different ways that these can happen, but I've gone through periods where I can feel myself kind of slipping back towards that um, depression line. And then I have to work extra hard to kind of pull myself back out of that. Um, but I haven't, it's been a year and a half plus now that I, I still take medication for my, for my rheumatoid arthritis, which is why I tell you, I would never tell anybody don't, especially if somebody like depression, and anxiety are not things to mess around with. If you're having a severe issue that you feel like you cannot handle on your own, you should seek professional counsel. My thing with it is it should not, it, they treat your symptoms. They cannot cure you. They cannot fix you. They can only help balance the chemicals in such a way that you feel more calm. What, you know, back if you're up here with anxiety or down here with depression, they can kind of balance it out a little better, but you're not going to get any better without doing all that extra work, whether it's therapy, mindset adjustments, you know, it, whatever your method is, you're, they can't cure you. Like right. They, there's right. nothing really medicine can cure. And I'm, I just quit taking a very expensive, very powerful uh, drug for rheumatoid arthritis a few weeks ago for the same reason. Well, different reason, but the fact that it treat, it's, treats symptoms. Like the only thing that, for, for what I know is it cures anything is antibiotics. You know, antibiotics, antifungal, like that kind of stuff, you know, kills the bacteria. But there's, like, there's no cure for cancer. They just make it so that they kill all of the cancer cells and it disappears. That's not a cure. Like you're, and I know that sounds harsh because I'm not a doctor, but I have since taken on, I'm on a completely different path anyways. Um, well, speaking to that anxiety and stuff, I used to have really bad um, anxiety attack and back then when i was in 2011 i really had major depression i think that people don't take the consideration that i read a book called i don't know if you know bruce lipton work but your mind is an engine of power where when you're thought when you're depressed and because i had a talk with my friend long uh, a while back that when your anxiety your whole body starts to shut down. When you're depressed, you start to shut down because of your thoughts are really powerful. Your thoughts affect your body. Um, I lived that, just so you, I'll, I'll explain in a minute. Go ahead. Yeah, it, it, um, but see, that's the thing that we don't get. Like, I mean, people, people are like, don't get that. I didn't understand it either until maybe a year ago. Yeah, so that's, that's incredible. Like, I, I, like, we have the ability, well, I don't know. I, I hear so many stories that, people have the ability to heal themselves. But yeah, go ahead, you were talking about Oh, no, I was just gonna say, like I said from day one, when I first got sick, I was I was diagnosed with something called Guillain-Barre syndrome. Um, and my body did, it shut down. It was, I was paralyzed. I was, I went, ended up in the emergency room. I spent 16 days in the hospital. Um, and I kept describing like it feels like a stroke like it has all of the elements of a stroke except for the brain activity um and it took them a week plus to diagnose me with the Guillain-Barre and then the treatment and rehab and whatnot but I kept calling it like the only way I could describe it to people was a physical nervous breakdown and I didn't realize the impact that statement had until maybe a year ago um, but that was just how I was describing because that's what it felt like. My body completely shut down. Like I was not supposed to come home, let alone thrive. And, um, so now just reading into some of these things and I'm really understanding more the mind body connection and, and whatnot. That's what happened. Like my body had a nervous breakdown. Like it, it said, if you know, you're not going to take care of yourself, this is the only way we're going to get you to, I mean, I was under a ton of stress. I had just broken up with my ex. Um, my, my husband and I were separated for like six years. 
And so my ex in between that I bought this house was we separated. I didn't know how I was going to pay the mortgage. I had to go back to work. Um, my son, well, my kids were home for the summer. So I was trying to work from home at this newer job that I had doing accounting work. I was working 11 hours a day to do six hours of work. I was taking tons of caffeine. Like, you know, my son was having all kinds of issues at that time and, you know, in and out of doctor's appointments and people at the house. And it was just like, I was 113 pounds and just, I'm five foot nine. Okay. So for, that was the lowest I had weighed probably since seventh grade. Mm -hmm. I was, oh. yeah, I was super physically sick and I was ignoring all of it because in my mind, I just had to keep going. Like if I kept going, I had mind over matter, but I had it wrong. You know what I mean? Like it was like, if I just keep telling myself that I can do this, I can do this. And my body was like, nope, we can't do this anymore. Like shut me down. That was it. And I had to start all over. Like I had to learn how to walk, how to eat, how to talk, how to, you know, move my body, how to do like all of these things that they do with a lot of times with stroke patients. Um, and, but, but so when you said that, that it's a hundred percent right. Like if your your body can only do so much and it can only heal so much. And if you're like neglecting it, like I wasn't eating, I wasn't it just all kinds of things. And it my but my whatever, something saved me and was like, look, you're meant for more. Like this is not what we're doing. <laughs> like you're done doing this this way because we're gonna force you to stop and it shut me down. And and like I said, to me, it took me a really long time to get over that though. Like the, like I kept trying to go back to my old life, not necessarily like the eating habits or whatnot, but like, like the go, go, go mentality. Like I just wanted to come home and like go back to work. And, you know, I came home from the hospital on a Wednesday or something and was back to work on Thursday, working from home. And it proved that, like I couldn't do it. I just, I couldn't keep going like that. And it, we talked before about how like I went through the seven stages of grief and whatnot. It was just, I couldn't figure out how to get back to the old me when the whole time me was saying, we, we don't want to go back to the old you. <laughs> you know what I mean? And it, it, it took a long, really long time. Like, probably six years to accept the fact that going back to the old me was a really bad idea anyways you know so well thank you so much for like sharing that story it's um you conquer yes but uh, um I, I was listening since you were also an entrepreneur like uh, what's your message for any entrepreneur mom um, who's trying to build their business like what is your message like for them um i see my message really i haven't thought about it like that well it's because as far um, as entrepreneur moms but my my whole thing like so my um and you'll get to see the my unbreakable campaign that i'm working on um in a couple of weeks well if you um, if you're willing to um i can uh if you're working on it i can like share it with the link in my youtube uh, description if you want. but you yeah, go ahead yeah i mean I, so the my unbreakable campaign is basically i've been looking for a way to support um other people with chronic illness like i said in the beginning who are stuck and, and my message um so there's a lot of there's a lot of what do you want to bring forth to yeah go ahead i want i just want people to understand that they don't have to stay stuck and it's gonna i mean it's gonna be hard it's not gonna be easy especially when you've got a chronic illness because chronic illness literally fills every facet of your life um but there, i mean lifestyle habits and mindset changes and whatnot like they can still pursue their dreams like their dreams may have changed because i know mine did um for the better but that you still have like your life doesn't get thrown away like these people some a lot of these people are in their early 30s like i was you know or or early 40s and you've still got 40 plus 50 years maybe of life left like are you really going to spend it being miserable um, and like, 
that's, I think, why I ended up quitting the Humera after six and a half months because I was exhausted and I couldn't do anything. And I'm like, I, I can't, even if this gives me five more livable years, like it's not going to be worth it because I'm a lump. Like I can't do anything. Like I don't want that. I'll take 10 off the end if the next 30 are going to be better, you know? So my, the Unbreakable campaign is just a nod to um, anybody who's struggling with, with in adversity in general, it, this kind of applies to, but the fact that we're all still here, we're all still here, you know, fighting another day, like, to me, like, I feel unbreakable, like, the amount of stuff that I've gone through, like, forget about in the past 40 years, just in the past 10 years, is mind-blowing, and I'm still here pressing forward, you know, continuing to want to be better for myself, for my kids, for other people. And I wanted a way to show how, so like there's a lot of people talk about the, um, how chronic illness is invisible illness. And a lot of people are bringing awareness to these different invisible illnesses. Um, and, and I get that, like I'm, I'm supportive of that 100%, but I would rather people see past the fact that I had, like, I almost kind of wanted to be like, people don't even know that I have that, you know what I mean? When you meet me on the street, I don't be like, hi, I'm Bonnie, I have rheumatoid arthritis. Like that's not, you know, that's, that's not who I am, it's just a part of who I am. And I think people get so, con so perfect example, we're at Tony Robbins and, this follows with the, um, the secret where focus goes, energy flows, right? So I found myself slipping back into that misery this past six months with the Humera, where the more I was focusing on my, um, my illness, like whether it was on social media or talking to people or the fact that I was taking this drug or rearranging my whole schedule around it and whatnot, like the sicker I was getting, like I was getting like, um exponentially sicker like every week like i could feel it like i wasn't getting any better i was getting way worse and so i i, I kind of want to take the focus off trying to make these invisible illnesses visible and focus more on helping people understand that Yes, we want people to be accepting of us. Yes, some of us have disabilities. Yes, we want people to recognize the fact that we have these illnesses and things are harder for us. However, if you're constantly focusing on that, you're never gonna do anything else. You know what I mean? Like I'm all for advocating and for disability rights and all of those things, of course I am. But I almost feel like, and I started to slip into myself, that the people who are only ever focused on what their illness is, what their limitations are, what they can't do. Right, right, right. You can or you can't, you're gonna be right. And I, I was, I was again, like I said, I was living that. Like I was feeling, I couldn't put my finger on it at first, but I was realizing that like rearranging my schedule and my family life and my business and everything around this medication that wasn't even, it's not a cure, it was a possibility of slowing down the progression of my illness. And the sicker that I got, like I just kept, I was getting worse and worse and worse. And I'm like, this is the complete opposite direction of where I'm trying to go right now. <laughs> so yeah, I need to fine tune the unbreakable campaign and the wording and verbiage. Um, right now, what, what it was kind of, what I was, trying to do was my original idea was to um help people with chronic illness focus it's still based on the focus but like so somebody's word may be confident somebody else's word may be resilient someone else's word like and i was doing custom wanted to do custom designs and i'm like what word kind of encompasses all of this again back to the one word um and for me really it's just unbreakable like these people i have been through i mean lots of people have been through so much and they're still fighting and it's 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 kind of like you almost know that at this point no matter what life is going to throw at you you're going to figure it out like you may knock you down for a while but you're going to get back up and keep going 
And that's why unbreakable is such an important word to me. So. What make you, what inspire you to inspire others? Like, I can tell that you care for people. Like, you really do care. Like, what, what's inside you that? Because I hate, I mean, so another thing Evan says, and a lot of these things I hear after the fact, I'm like, oh, yeah, okay, that explains why I do X, Y, Z. And he huh. says your, your passion comes from your pain, right? That's right. how Evan describes That's it. And other That's people true. have other ways to describe it. And, you know, but that made a lot of sense to me. And it's, and I had to backtrack and, and because somebody asked me the same question. I'm like, I don't know. I've just always really wanted to help people. But I've always wanted to help those groups of people who I could resonate with. So like when I was a little kid, this having the medical care, like I wanted to open a free clinic because growing up, our health insurance was, was horrible. Like we didn't really go to the doctor. We didn't go to the dentist. Like we didn't have, you know, and unless there was an emergency, you know, or something really serious going on. So I wanted to be able to provide that to other people. Now in seventh grade, I had no idea that's why I was, you know, like that none of this, really made sense to me that's just what I really wanted to do and I I know like being stuck like feeling hopeless and helpless has got to be probably the worst feeling on the planet like I've had massive anxiety attacks like go to the hospital anxiety attacks and I've had you know severe depression and and felt tons of physical pain but for me like the worst thing is feeling stuck or like all your, you have no chance at your dreams, you know, just like, like I can't help myself, which makes me helpless and hopeless. If I'm, if I can't help myself, then how am I going to help other people? You know, like that was just a miserable place to be. And, and the thing is, is I know that, that, that you don't have to stay there. You know what I mean? Like I, I know that if I can pull myself out without any direct guidance, of like, here, this is what you need to be doing, then I can hopefully pass that knowledge on to other people who are ready to hear it and help them get out of, because that's a huge key piece is that people have to be ready to, because I could tell you right now, five, six, seven years ago, had you told me, well, this is all your fault and you need to figure out a way to fix it, I'd been like, fuck you. Like, yeah. Come on yeah. Out, don't talk to me. Like, yeah. I, I didn't make myself this sick. Who would do something like this? But I did. Like, I'm now on a new mission to figure out how I got sick in the first place so that I can undo that because that'll be something else I can teach people at some point. But but I did. Like, that's my fault, whether it's hereditary or not. Like, had I not been living my life the way I was at that point, I probably never would have gotten, my immune system wouldn't have been so shot that I was able to get the illness that I had you know well thank you for ludicrous maybe I, i'm completely wrong and they're going to find out 30 years from now that you know that that's completely incorrect and it's only hurt genetic but like or some bug bit me and you know what i mean like but still like whether that's true or not it still doesn't negate the fact that i wasn't living in a healthy way at that point like i just wasn't See, the thing is, you know, that's why I'm glad that you, you say something like, you, if you were told people that there's another way of living, people would argue with you. Trust me. I, Because for me, I like to talk about my dreams because my dream is to uh, interview people and people would think it was preposterous because uh, I told my friend, I was like, no, I want to interview this guy. I want to interview. It's like, who do you think you are just to interview this guy? But the problem is like, they because people live all based on fear and you know I'm, I'm glad that you uh talk about that and you're right um evan do talk about that a lot in his video about you know your 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 mission whatever your passion come from your pain because you don't want uh, people to go through that again right that's why i i don't want people to go uh, there are people who are out there who are in special education who think that um that they're dumb that they don't have any Thing to offer to the world. Uh, I never actually explained it that way before. Um, I always said I was dumb, but I, it was my pain that I didn't knew that that we can become genius from like because I learned it through books. Um, I hated um, homework, but I read about the brain. 
<laughs> I, I read about the brain, and it was that, that's that's my pain um, that I want to uh, inspire people. Also, what does success look like to you? Success looks to me. So let me ask you to hold on for one minute. So you asked, what does success look like to me? Um, so had you asked me five years ago, I probably, even maybe two years ago, I had a completely different answer for you. Um, just like we were talking about before with, you know, house and kids and, and family and, um, you know, the different goals that I had. But now to me, and I had, it's funny you, you asked me this because I had um, a woman named Lily Ma. She's a, a life coach that I won a session with. Uh, probably about a month ago we talked and so I've been successful at a lot of things um, but I never really looked at it at those things kind of like as something you would measure success on so like my kids they're, they, they're doing well you know they're healthy and happy for the most part a lot of people consider that a huge success you know but for me, that was just the way I did parent. You know what I mean? Like that was, it wasn't like when I had my girl, I'm going to, they're going to be happy. And you know what I mean? Like they're going to be this and that. Like, no, you just, this is kind of how we, how you parent. And now for me, it's, so my success now isn't measured by how happy my kids are or how clean my house is, although I'd like it to be clean anyways. Um, it's more so being able to get up every day. And this is gonna sound so cliche, but being able to do what you love. Um, and just being like happy. And I don't mean like, like you're giggling and positive every moment of the day, but it, it's kind of being in a place where if, you lose your house, you lost your car, you lost this, you lost, like nothing about your demeanor would change. So, like, would I like to live in a bigger house? Somewhat. Would I like to live in a different, well, I do want to move across the country, but that's because of the weather. Um, but like, it's no longer, those are no longer like milestones on like a success chart for me, if that makes sense. Whereas if, yes, I would be upset if we lost our house or, or whatnot, but that's not what makes a person successful. I think somebody who, who is successful is someone who can get up every day, look themselves in the mirror and actually say, I'm happy. Like I'm content, I am happy. Um, and content is such a buzzword anymore, um, so here in the States anyways. Um, where contentment is considered a negative thing. The people who are content aren't striving for something more. I don't believe that. I think it's saying if nothing else happens, I can live like this every single day. Does that make sense? Like, yes, we all wanna you know, move up. Like, like, I'm not gonna quit learning. I'm not gonna quit talking to people. I would love to impact more lives, but I think it's having the, the ability to look at yourself in the mirror in the morning and just say, you know, I'm happy, you know? Um, I mean, I was thinking when we were talking, I was like, you want to impact more people. Uh, maybe in the future, we can also do an interview just like this. Uh, the, if you're a woman, uh, that'd be awesome. Um, the story that you told is very inspiring and that I hope that you know, a lot of parents and moms out there are, you know, they don't, they're, you, you, you're doing an ex uh, amazing example for how we can change the mindset, you know, I'm thankful for that. Oh, you're right. welcome. We, I believe, I believe now that we can because I've done it. Um, again, like I said, had you told me five years ago that I was in control of your, my mind, I would have been like, you're ludicrous, Chris, I have depression, I have anxiety, like, if I was in control of my mind, why would I be taking all this medication, like, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have listened, probably, 
you know what I mean? And that's why I also have a strong belief in that things happen to us, one, for a reason, but they, they also come to us when we're ready for them. Um, yeah. Because with my friend Lauren that I was telling you about that introduced me to EFT. I had heard about EFT tapping five years prior to that. And I'm like, I, I had no idea what it was and I had no interest in looking it up. Like it could have been a 30 second search on YouTube. I could have found out what it was and it was helping, you know, people all over the place with chronic and I had no interest in looking it up. I'm like, that sounds dumb. Like, <laughs> you know what I mean? And now I do it almost every morning. Um, but it, again, mind, like mindset, success, like these are all new, these are buzzwords now. Um, but it's so true. But that's not a bad thing. You know yeah. what I mean? Like, but it's it's, it's, it's really shift though. It shift your mindset though. Like it, it's like, if, but the thing about it, think, think about it. If your mindset, like, even though it's like people say, like, it's people make it, if you didn't go on this, you know, success or personal development path, you wouldn't be where you are. You wouldn't be able to, you know, like, I wouldn't be able to interview people. I mean, like, think about it. We wouldn't be able to, you know, you met Evan Carmichael. Like, that changed it. That, that meant that it, if we can, if we change our minds, if we change some, like, the way we think, we, 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 we the door's open. For oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and that's the, the attraction, law of attraction, too, is, like, so now I'm focused on being, a, you know, a better person and doing this and impacting people. Well, those things are going to start coming to me because now that I feel like I'm actually able to do that, where before... I never even, like, I mean, even even four months ago. So, so you asked me like when I got the idea to that I wanted to help people and whatnot. About a year ago, maybe a year ago in like in like February, January, um, I had jumped on somebody's Instagram live and he brought me on to his live and he is a like a dating coach, um, <coughs> relationship coach. <coughs> Excuse me. And he asked me about what I wanted to do or something to that effect. And I was like, I just want to help people. I'm like, I don't know what I'm going to do, how I'm going to do it. You know, and I'm going on and on. And he said, well, why? And so he's like asking me different questions to kind of pull it out of me. And by the time our conversation was over, he said the same thing you did. He's like, your face just lit completely up. And Lily Ma said the same. She's like, I want to watch you, but I want you to watch this back and how you talk because my whole thing is like what am I going to talk about you know what I mean like I want to be a speaker and I'm like my mind goes blank and I'm like okay maybe I'm just not ready yet I'm not asking myself the right questions so I have to learn how to do that of course but I, I told him so I started a podcast I have this this thing with this guy and, and I decide uh this Instagram live I said okay I'm gonna be you know I'm going to do like you do. I'm going to interview people and I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that. And I got all excited. And like the first time I was super excited for something in a really long time and, and I'm taking notes and, you know, trying to figure all of this stuff out and, and everything came crashing down. Like it was just a huge disaster. I'm like, okay, well maybe, and again, this was just a year ago. I'm like, maybe this isn't what I'm supposed to be doing. I'm going to go back to doing t-shirts because I know how to do t You know what I mean? Like this is, that's what I'm good at. That's what I'm going to keep doing. Maybe this is a sign because no matter what I tried to do, some roadblock was being thrown up and rather at that point at looking at it as a as a like a good kind of test like are you do you really want this are you going to keep going like if bad stuff happens are you going to quit kind of thing i took it as a sign that that was not the direction i was supposed to be going and it came up again um like I said, I was talking to Lily Ma and I said, well, in five years, actually it came up one more time before that. And I was talking to some, a business coach friend of mine and they were like, well, what do you want to do in like five years? And I'm like, like, where do you want to see this business? Like, what do you, you want your role to be? And I'm like, uh, I don't know. Like I hadn't thought about it. I was like, I just want to be, you know, I want to help people. I saw you have saying was I want to help people. And I, so I sat down at one point and just wrote two whole pages. And by the end, I had this like four or five year plan of how I was going to become a speaker and how I was going to hire people to take over my business. And basically like building this business to me up until a month or so ago was giving me credibility. 
So I wanted to build a business so that when I went to speak to people, I could say, well, I have these chronic illnesses. I built a business. So can you. And not realizing the whole time that although I'm not as far ahead as I'd like to be, I'm still further ahead than I was seven years ago. And there are people who every single day are getting diagnosed and going home and feeling stuck that I could already help it. Like I don't have, like I was trying to prove it to myself and prove it to the world and give myself credibility. And until Lily said to me, I, I wrote those pages and I was, I, I still was stuck. I'm still figuring I have to wait five years. And I was making excuses. Like part of it is my, my youngest won't start school for about three and a half more years. Um, he's going to be a late starter. And uh, I'm like, well, I need to wait till he's in school. And you know what I'm saying? This and that. And they were all excuses. It was, it was all excuses because I had, I'm not used to not knowing what the answer is. Like I have always been so freaking resourceful that anytime I got into a problem, I was able to figure something out. Well, it might not have been ideal, but it, I was able to figure it out. And this was something like, I was like, I have no idea what I'm doing. And I think that was the biggest thing was like, I was making up all these reasons. And like I said to you, I still don't have a clue, like what I'm going to talk about right off the bat. Um, but I think that it comes with practice just like anything else. But she said to me, why five years? Why this five year plan? And I told her, I said, well, I need to build this. And, you know, I have the credibility. She's like, you have credibility now. You have seven plus years worth of experience with this that you could talk about. And I'm like, I never even thought about it that way. Um, and she's like, it's all their excuses. And I'm like, you're probably right. <laughs> like, you know, and the more she talked to me and, and we talked, she's like, your fate split up and, and you're really passionate about this. You just haven't taken that stuff, that step because you don't yet believe you can. And I'm like, you're right. I don't. I have no idea what to do. And didn't feel like I had any kind of credibility because I didn't have that. Like we were talking about that idea of success yet. I hadn't reached that success point um, by having a successful business. And so, yeah, I, I, I do, I would love to be able to impact people. And, and after talking to her and then talking to Evan again, um, now it's figuring out the, the how. So Evan talks about making the big decisions with your heart and the little ones with your head. It's like, like once you have decided that this is what you're going to do, she's like, I can help you with all the details. It's actually not as hard as you're making it to be. And I'm like, how did I know that was the answer you were going to give me? <laughs> like I'm overcomplicating it. You know, um, no, but the, the, the thing is you're so um, into Evan Carmichael uh, video. I know you watch it, probably watch it because I watch his video too. And I know you're where he, you know, talk about you make your decisions based on your heart. And, you know, I, I love his videos. It's very um, inspiring. Yeah. It's what's funny to me is I actually don't watch a whole lot of his YouTube videos still. I've watched How, Where are you calling him? Where, on Instagram. Where huh? He's on Instagram mm -hmm. and he posts a lot of video clips on Instagram. And I, kind of at one point i didn't stop watching youtube but because for several months last year i was consuming so much on youtube i was getting like nothing else done i think i told you about that the other day is it like i was watching gary v videos all day long and just taking notes and like you know feeding the kids and putting one down for a nap and doing it and then like just writing notes and notes and notes and notes and notes and i'm like so, and I, and I keep using Evan because he's fresh in my mind right now. He's, you know, massive action. Like you need to say, thinking about it is not going to do you any good. Taking notes is not going to, like they may help somewhat with some of the technical, but if you get stuck somewhere, you can look something up. And it was just another stalling tactic in a way. It was like, I got to keep consuming this because I don't know what I'm going to do. Instead of getting started, I was just trying to learn as much as I could, whereas I could have been learning through making mistakes and people don't want to do that. It's painful. Like they, yeah, they don't. yeah um that's that's where i want to bring uh, uh to talk about too uh 
that people often think that failure or mistakes are like people have so much past uh, regret that they think that mistakes are like um, like it's 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 there to learn. It's there to um, like I, I view uh, failure as nothing more an experimentation that you didn't know. Right. You, you experiment. Good. And I completely agree with you. And there's also a difference between like accidents and mistakes. Like, like I joke with I joke with my daughter, and this is going to sound really cruel, but actually my husband my husband jokes with her more. But he would use the word um, that she was an accident. She was an accident. We didn't plan her. And I'm like, yes, but there's a huge difference between an accident and a mistake. A mistake is something you typically regret an accident is something that happens when you don't mean it to happen that way and that's where i kind of look at this whole making mistakes thing differently is that mistakes are things that you regret like accidents you know whether you get into a car accident or you have an accident or something happens on accident or the outcome wasn't what you expected so that was an ass it doesn't mean it was a mistake like did you learn as you were going okay cool so take what you learned and try it another way and maybe that's just my non-textbook description of the two words maybe or maybe i'm getting too technical and picking them apart but i don't feel like when you, your intent is pure and you're trying to learn and you're moving forward, even if you get knocked back, like you can't make mistakes. Like there's no such thing. You're just learning experiences. You might not get the outcome that you want, but that doesn't mean that it was a mistake. Like, how are you going to know something's right if you haven't done it the wrong way? You know, or how are you going to know something's wrong if somebody else hasn't done it the right way? Like, there's just... You know, I don't know. I I look at those things a lot differently now. That's for sure. Well, yeah, I mean, you know, what you say is incredible. I mean, very inspirational. <laughs> um, where can we find you on uh, line? So I am on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. Um, oh, and YouTube. I have one YouTube video of. Um, at Posh Notions, so that's P O S H N O T I O N S, um, and also over at poshnotions.com. I have a website currently, um, <clears throat> and then uh, I'm on LinkedIn as well, but I have not been active on there well, very much lately. So, no, thank you. Uh, wait, uh, after this, um, can you share me your YouTube channel uh, with me, your link, and then your um your websites in the for uh DM me in the twitter so i can put it in the description in youtube and then also okay. I can, and also i can subscribe to you too yeah yeah i'm basically at posh notions across social i got to make that very easy which well, I, I, mean, no, cause I, 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 I will definitely send it to you and thank you so much uh well, you've been, thank you you're welcome and now after i uh, done uh with this video i'll uh, i'll share with you and uh Hopefully, looking for you. I'll see you. Okay. Have a All good. right. Sounds good. All right. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.